Chapter 10. I slept badly, and for once, it was not Elena's fault. Every time I started to fall asleep, I jerked awake. When I finally got up before dawn, Elena's bed was rumpled but empty. I guessed where she was. I knew she did not want to watch me leave in person. I surveyed everything I had packed for the journey and pulled Don Clemente's packet from its hiding place. I put the money in my pouch, checking to be sure it did not bulge beneath my clothing. I packed Lalo's soccer jersey and stuck Chewy's knife into my front right pocket. I looked into the cracked mirror above the dresser one last time. I saw the same high cheekbones, the same family dimples, the same slightly hooked nose, but I hardly recognized myself. Somehow it seemed my outside had not caught up with my inside. There were my very same deep set, almost black eyes and eyebrows that swooped up at the ends. How could I look the same and feel so different? I peered again at my reflection, the same old face, the same old Miguel. I picked my way in the half light of the dawning morning down to the corral and the little barn. Sure enough, there in the darkness, I could just make out Elena. She was curled up on the straw, lying next to the dog and the cow. This was her other bed. The gentle breathing of the animals, the warmth and the sweet smell of the hay had always been able to put her to sleep. I left Elena alone. I was not going to tell her I was sorry I was leaving and she was staying. Why should I? She hadn't wished me good luck. She had not even said that she would miss me. She had said nothing to me, nothing at all. Well, she'd have to get over it sooner or later. Abuelita had prepared some food for the first part of my trip. She packed and unpacked it several times, fussing over where it fit best. She finally tucked the oranges and apples away on the sides of my backpack and lay the tacos on top. I have something else for you, mijo. Abuelita lifted her Virgen de Guadalupe medallion from around her neck. I had never seen her take it off, not once in my whole life. The bright blue of the Virgin's mantle reflected the light of the sun as its first rays peeked through the window. A piece of the silver chain caught in her hair. I untangled it, but a few strands of gray remained in the links. I left them. Abuelita gathered up the chain and the medallion, pressed it into my hand, and placed her hand on my head. Mijo, que la virgen te gorde, te proteja y te suida con todo su amor en tus caminos, she began. Her low, raspy voice was strong but her hand trembled. Y que la virgen tu abra los ojos hacia todos los que tienen menos que tú. This was an old blessing, but the words felt new. This time the blessing was for me. Except for Elena, who cried at anything, we were a dry-eyed family. No one cried at leaving, no matter how long we would be separated. We liked to pretend we would be gone just a few days, instead of years. We liked to fool ourselves that the absence was easier to take that way. I looked up at Abuelita. This time, the tears rolled freely down both of our faces. She had been my mother. I had been her son. There was no sense pretending we would see each other again. She was old. I would not return for many years. I might not return at all. 
Chapter 11 It took me three hours to walk to the city, but it felt like minutes. I wanted to catch the next bus north at noon. Then I would be slightly ahead of the timetable set out by Don Clemente. I wandered around, peering into shop windows and pushing my way through the crowded stalls in the Mercado. The city was a crossroads for a set steady stream of people headed north, south, east, and west. Cars and trucks belched black exhaust that burned my eyes. The taxi drivers blasted their horns and a loud womp womp of music blared from the speakers of other cars. At mid-morning, I stood in the shade cast by the giant wall of the cathedral and pulled the last of the tacos de cabrito out of my bag. The tortillas had turned hard and cold, but I ate every bite. Two hours early, I found my way to the bus station. What if the seats were sold out? I did not think I could stand to wait for the next bus. I was n wasn't the only one worried. Dozens of anxious travelers sat side by side, their belongings stacked at their feet. I bought my ticket, found a seat on a worn wooden bench, and settled down to wait. An older couple sat across from me. They propped their legs up on a huge bulging suitcase. He wore an old black suit, the shoulders dusted by dirt. She too wore black a long dress with shiny buttons. In her hands, she held a small photograph, its edges tattered and worn. She caressed the face on the photo with her index finger. I decided they must be going to the funeral of their only son. A young father and mother near my age sat on top of two boxes tied together with rope. They passed a baby back and forth, but it cried nonstop anyway. Two more string bags held some fruit and drinks, a bean pot, a molcajete, a box of soap. This was everything they owned in the world. I thought they must be headed to La Capital to try out a different life. They would still be poor there, it would just be a different kind of poor. I felt quick and light and alert. Everyone else seemed burdened, loaded down. My backpack and my pouch weighed no more than a feather. The bus finally pulled up to the station. The mother and father with the baby stowed their boxes, mounted the stairs, and sat at the front. In India, wearing a bright, multicolored skirt and blouse, slid into the second seat. A shawl covered most of her face. For modesty, she grabbed the ends and pulled it tighter around her neck. She carried only a small string bag. I decided she was going to help her sister, who had just had a baby. I made my way to the back of the bus and claimed a seat next to a window. Three young men settled down behind me. They didn't wear their traditional pants and shirts, but I could tell they too were indios. Triquis, maybe. Zap zapotecos, or mixtecos. They sat shoulder to shoulder, speaking softly in their own language. Maybe they did not speak Spanish. Probably they just did not want me to understand. Two more young men grabbed the seat in front of me. One wore a New York Yankees cap facing backwards on his head. His t-shirt had a faded cartoon drawing of a square-faced kid with spiky yellow hair. The other man wore an Oakland Raiders cap pointed forward and a ragged sweatshirt with a Notre Dame logo. What is the name of the guy they told us about? Do you think we can find him? What if we can't find him? One asked anxiously. Would you stop asking me that? 
the other replied. I already told you ten times. He used the annoyed tone of an older brother, one I used with Elena when I wanted her to shut up. I guessed by their accents they came from Guatemala or maybe Honduras. A black man slid into the seat across the aisle. He was traveling alone and light, like me. I nodded at him slightly. He returned the nod with one of his own, adding a shy smile. He carried one small backpack held together in some places by duct tape and in others by crude hand stitching. Out of this, he pulled a portable CD player. He fiddled with the earphones, adjusted the volume, and settled back, listening intently. Who was he? Where was he from? I finally decided he was a tourist, probably not as poor as he looked. Several other men entered the bus. Each was single. Most traveled alone. I counted a total of 15 young men, including myself. I bet all of us had the same destination, somewhere across La Lina. Here we were together, close enough to touch. There, up north, one might go to Chicago, another to Atlanta or Michigan. What were some other places I had heard about? Oregon, Yakima, Oklahoma, some place called Little Rock. <laughs> Finally, yet another man sat right next to me. I let out a big sigh. I wanted to be alone so I could stretch out a little and sleep. I knew I needed to rest when I could, but he was barely seated before he started talking. A fast flowing river of words as if he had been starved for conversation. Hola, me llamo Javier. You can call me Javi, he began. What is your name? I am from El Salvador. You are from here, right? He paused only long enough to kick his backpack beneath the seat in front of him. He had silver hair and deep wrinkles around his mouth and the corners of his eyes. I looked closer. He was a lot older than anyone else on the bus. This is a good bus. I can tell already. You can always tell by the driver, he continued without taking a breath. I have been on two that broke down. Where are you going? Maybe we could go together. It is boring to travel alone. He looked at me hopefully. Don Clemente had warned me not to give away my route or my contacts. Besides, I did not want the burden of another human being. So I lied. I'm going to La Capital to stay with my brother and sister-in-law. Javier's shoulder slumped in disappointment, but within minutes, his friendly talk started up again. Over the next hour, I found out he came from the mountains of El Salvador, somewhere. He used to work on a big coffee plantation. He left behind his wife and two children. I had no choice, he explained. The coffee prices went in the toilet. With no work, no money, what was I supposed to do? I'm going north to New York, where my brother works in a restaurant. He can get me a job. Within a short amount of time, I will have money to send for the family. He paused and looked at me more closely. You must be about the same age as my boy, Eduardo. He wanted to come with me, but of course he had to stay to help out the family. He was not happy about it. You are not going to La Capital, are you? Javi said suddenly. It wasn't really a question. He had not believed my story. I have always been a bad liar. You could come with me, you know, he offered. He waited for me to answer. This is my second try. I have learned a few things, and sometimes it is good to have someone to watch your back. I said a silent thanks to Don Clemente. With his people and his coyote, I did not need anyone else. If Javier had already tried once and failed, I would be better off by myself, alone. The last thing I wanted was an old man tagging along with me. How much help could someone like that be anyway? 
Gracias, I murmured. I've got my own plans. I leaned my head against the dirt street window and closed my eyes. What was Javi saying now? I'd quit paying attention. Words just bubbled out of his mouth. He didn't seem to notice that I was not really listening. I felt the bus stop. I opened my eyes, straining to see through the grime. Three federal police cruisers blocked the road in front of us, and a white transport bus stood empty by the side of the road. Javier sat up straight beside me. This is bad news, he said. The federales have a special internal procedure to look for people like me. You know, people traveling through Mexico to get to the north. You're lucky, he continued. The federales won't bother you. After all, you are Mexican, a citizen. As tu paes, you belong here. I was relieved. I had my school identification, which should work for this check, but I was now suddenly worried for Javier. Pretend you're Mexican, I said. How will they know? He laughed. The first time I tried to come north, they tricked me with one of their questions, the ones they used to separate people like me from Mexican citizens. They asked me how many stars on the Mexican flag. I guessed and said three. They laughed and sent me right back across the border to Guatemala. Javier sighed loudly, then continued. But there's no end to the tricks, is there? Besides, just listen to me. If they ask me to talk, they will know. It was true. His accent wasn't like mine, and not like any of the accents I'd heard before in Mexico. A fat federal boarded the bus slowly. His bulky figure blocked the front window. From under his cap, I saw his eyes move from passenger to passenger, he lifted up the driver's microphone, his breathing still heavy from the short climb up the bus steps. Exit with your belongings. Line up by the side of the bus in single file, he commanded. His eyes continued to glide over us, checking to see who might resist. Everyone did exactly as he said. No one even complained. He smirked. To him, we were just a bunch of pobros, pobres, now under his control. Outside the bus, I found myself near the end of the line. The Federal strutted back and forth in front of the passengers. His name tag glinted in the sun. Capitan Morales, it read. His gut hung out over his belt. He clutched his clipboard importantly, tapping it rhythmically with his pen. This is a routine check, he announced. I will ask each of you a few questions and then you will be free to reboard the bus with your things. At the front of the line was the young couple with their baby. Morales asked them many questions, too many for a routine check. The father answered each quickly. Still, the Capitan continued to ask and ask again. I saw the father reach into his pocket. He turned his back to us, and I knew he was taking out money to pay off the Federal. He did not want trouble for his family. He just wanted to get where he was going. The Capitan was making an example of the father. The message was loud and clear. Look how easy this can be, you poor fools. I can mess up your day so you don't make it hard on yourself. Morales had practice getting money out of poor people. My stomach turned over. How much could I offer? What would Morales accept? What would he do if I said I had nothing? I needed every single peso. I couldn't give him the bribe he was after. What good would it do to have only part of the money for my coyote? The Capitan moved down the aisle slowly. He pulled the two brothers with sports caps apart from the others. They had no papers. They had suspicious accents. Mostly, they had no money for bribes. La mordida was not an option. Morales would send them south to Guatemala along with the other young men who could not pull enough money out of their pockets. Included in this group was the black man I could not figure out. 
he gave me a small, sad smile. He did not seem surprised to be singled out in this way. Maybe this had happened to him many times before. Finally, the Capitan stopped directly in front of the small Indigena. Ever so slowly, he pulled the shawl down from her head, revealing her face. I had known that profile, even at a thousand meters. Elena, I gasped. She turned, looked at me, and whispered, Miguel. The color drained from her face, and her lower lip began to tremble. She took one step toward me, but the Capitan grabbed her arm and pushed her back roughly. Elena tripped on her shawl, falling to her knees. Capitan Morales turned toward me. I could almost see his brain working very slowly. Who was Elena? Who was I? How were we connected? All he could figure out was that Elena was not who she pretended to be. Anyone in Mexico would know that her face did not match the India clothing she wore. And then at that very moment, the Yankee-capped young man, one of the brothers, muttered, Cobarde. He said it just loud enough for the Capitan to hear. A guy like Morales must have heard bad words many times in his career. He must have been called lots of names. But to be called a coward? That was the worst. So much for his machismo. I saw the Capitan's eyes change. The Capitan felt disrespected, and he had been disrespected enough already for one day. I knew that he would stop trying to figure out who belonged in Mexico and who did not. He did not care who we were, where we came from, or where we were going. Morales would make us pay for this, his bad day. For the first time, I was afraid. Within minutes, Capitan Morales and the other two armed Federales escorted us onto the transport bus. All 15 men I had counted, plus Elena. No one protested. What would be the point? I sat once again next to Javier. I could not imagine how he felt having to go back for a second time. Javier muttered quietly, repetitive and rhythmic phrases I could not make out. Prayers, probably. Elena was in back of me. I felt her eyes bore into the back of my head, but I refused to turn and look at her. The bus chugged slowly to the south, toward the border with Guatemala. I remained motionless for many hours, watching the sun set on the wrong side of the bus. Morales would dump us on the other side of the river. My plan, Don Clemente's carefully laid plan, was in ruins, and Elena was to blame. <laughs>